like this. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Would you join us in worshiping this amazing God? And you may stand if you like.
Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kelsey Lynn, and I am on staff here, and it is wonderful to see so many of your faces today. We just finished with our final family service before summer, and it was just great to be with about 85 of our family's kids and just see them worshiping, and the kids were doing actions, and it was really great. But it's also a privilege to be here with you this morning, both those of you in person and those who are connecting online. June is a great month in the life of our church. We set aside time to celebrate milestones and to transition into our summer ministries. This year we have lots of opportunities for you to connect with others through projects, baby showers, bridal showers, and even a Friday lunch study group. I hope that you'll take time to connect in a way that works for you. I'd like to draw your attention to our bulletin. You'll see many details in there about these events. I'd like you to mark on your calendar June 20th. That is going to be our milestone service. This is where together as a community, we celebrate the important milestones in the lives of our students, graduates, and this year we'll be celebrating a baby dedication and more. June 27th, we'll be having a baptism service, which is really exciting. So I encourage you to come and be present for those services. Ladies, we have three opportunities to connect this month to gather as we celebrate the new lives of two sweet baby boys and a new marriage with a bridal shower for Nicole Taves, who's marrying Ryan Andres. This Tuesday is Sarah Jane's shower for her and baby Weston. There's still room to come. We just ask that you'd sign up on the app. And if you aren't able to come and would like to drop off a gift, you can drop it off at the church or to Kristen Redekop or Courtney Wall ahead of time. Lisa Braun has asked me to announce that our church is organizing a work bee to help Redberry. I don't know if you heard, but this week they transitioned their camps from day camps to overnight camps. So there is a lot to get ready, and they would appreciate our help. There is a time change on this from what was announced last week. It will now be on Tuesday from 1.30 till 5.00. Lisa is going to meet people in the parking lot here at church, and you can drive up together. She just asks that you would let her know by tonight if you are able to participate. In the bulletin, you'll also see that our partner MCC is having their annual relief sale next weekend, which includes a drive through food event. And they have an online auction going on right now. I checked it out. There's some awesome items on there, including a kayak and a beautiful handmade crokinole board. And so I'd encourage you to check that out and to support our partner if you can. And finally, I just wanted to include a reminder about Pastor Rod's lunch conversation um, that's happening on Fridays. We've been talking about how we as Christians understand grief. I've been able to attend two so far, and it's been really great. And I would encourage you that if you have time to come to even one or two, it's been a really rich time of conversation and thinking about how we as Christians respond to grief and experience grief. There's a lot of other items in your bulletin, and I'd encourage you to read over it this week. If you're joining us online, you can find the bulletin on our church website under the church family section. This week as I was preparing and getting ready for our services, I was thinking a lot about how our lives are often spent in a tug-of-war between joy and grief. In our week, we experience joy in all sorts of ways, like the beauty of the sunsets have been amazing this week, or in seeing friends and family we've missed for so long. We experience joy in all sorts of big and small ways, but we also experience moments of grief, like when we watch the news that's filled with the injustices happening in our world, in the brokenness of relationships, or in the unexpected hardships or illness. Both seem to be present constantly in our lives. In my devotions this week, I was reading in the Psalms, and I could see the same tension. In Psalm 88, the writer is lamenting, crying out to God. He says, I'm overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. I am like the one without strength. 
My eyes are dim with grief. I called to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. But then you turn the page to Psalm 89, and the psalmist is full of praise. And he says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With your mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm. He goes on and on, proclaiming God's goodness, even though just a moment before, he was lamenting. As I see the tension that's held even between these two chapters of the same book, it reminds me that we are not alone in this struggle. That God understands these pieces of our lives, and that he is big enough to handle both our lament and our joy. This morning, we are going to take some time to acknowledge the difficult situation that our First Nations people are facing, but we are also going to proclaim God's goodness, be reminded of his faithfulness, and worship him with joy. Both lament and hope will be a part of our mourning, and I believe that God welcomes both. I want to invite up Melissa Bechtold. Uh, Melissa is a member of our congregation, and she has a heart and a passion for our First Nations um, community and about how we as a church can respond. As we watched the news and grappled with the finding of this mass grave, we thought, you know, Melissa is someone who can lead us and who can help us pray for our community that are surrounding us. So, Melissa, if you want to come on up. She's going to lead, and then I will come back. Thanks, Kelsey Lynn. This morning, we'd like to take some time to focus our heart's attention on the overwhelming sadness that has swept across Canada in light of the Kamloops residential school findings. On May 27th, the remains of 215 children were found buried on the Kamloops Residential School site. There are no words. There are no words to describe the deep tragedy this holds for our nation, let alone our Indigenous people. Years of questions as to where have our children gone now answered, bringing a downpour of yet more trauma and pain. Today we want to acknowledge the grief that our Indigenous peoples are going through. We want to focus our hearts as a church on lifting them up to creator God for healing and restoration. So would you just take a moment, um, let's just quiet our hearts and then I'll pray. Jesus, we lift the indigenous communities of our nation to you right now. There's so much hurt and pain to navigate. There are so many injustices to speak of and questions needing answers to. We pray specifically for survivors of residential schools and their families, for, res- for generations of families that endured suffering and continue to struggle because of the inconceivable evil inflicted on them. Give wisdom to elders who are helping their people navigate through the brokenness provide strength for each day, and hope. Be near to every precious heart impacted. We pray for our government, Jesus. We need Holy Spirit-guided leadership to help reconcile this journey properly with dignity, respect, honor, and justice. Place people in positions of leadership who have your heart and who have boldness to guide our nation into action, justice, accountability, and truth. Lastly, speak to our hearts as individuals. Help us to advocate for change. Help us to be listening ears and aware of injustices that are happening around us. Forgive us when we've turned away from understanding, past judgment, or lived in ignorance to the hurt Indigenous people have suffered. Help our hearts be broken for change. And driven for truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. I'd like to end with a poem or a a lament similar to Kelsey Lynn sharing Psalm 88. But this is written 
just a few weeks ago by Dr. Cheryl Baer. Um, she's an associate professor at Regent College in Vancouver, BC. She wrote this, take your time, take days, sit with grief of these days, sit with her and let her weep, let her crawl into bed way too early and out of bed way too late, let her cancel all the shopping trips, all the plans and just sit with her, stroke her hair and tell her, reassure her that things will get, no, are getting better. Even if they are only won in court battles or through shaming the government into action, shame, shame on them. All of this work was not in vain. Every lecture, every slide, every chart exposed the truth. And now everyone can see. It took all of us to get here, to heal, to change. Now it will take all of us again to get there, to heal, to change, so our grandbabies can truly be free and can have better days and lives and deaths. Words spoken on a tear-soaked day, still reeling from the news and praying for our courageous and powerful elders, our residential school survivors, for my late mom, my aunties and uncles, grandparents, for all our relations. Um, if you are a non-Indigenous individual and searching for ways to understand and process all of what's going on right now, or you're grieved or angry over this, um, the church will be sending around some resources to help understand more, and you can look on the Facebook page or th at your email for that, um, for a way to display your support to Indigenous communities as well. Let's remember to keep praying um, let's keep learning and listening. Let's be advocates for change, bent on justice, and partners in restoration alongside a mighty, mighty God. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, as she said, this week we'll be posting on Facebook as well as emailing out some resources that we have received from our conference and our ministry partners that we hope you will find helpful. We wanted to also give you a moment to, an, another opportunity to respond tangibly to this. So I'd like to invite up Starla. Starla is also a member of our community and is partnering with Good Neighbors Food Center to host an event. Come on up, Starla. And she would like to extend an invitation to us and tell us a little bit more about it. Good morning. Good morning, church family. <clears throat> As I look around the room, I see many friends and kindred spirits in here, and I just am so grateful for that. In light of recent news and the discovery of 215 children found in a mass grave at a residential school in Kamloops, BC, Good Neighbors Food Center humbly invites the community, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to come together to pause to listen, and to recognize this tragedy. My name is Starla Bruno. I am a First Nations woman from the Thunder Child First Nations community. And my family, I'm part of the 60 Scoop, which is a direct reason why I landed up in the system was the residential schools. My mother went to residential schools and didn't learn how to care for her children. Both she got her culture taken away from her as well as the ability to know how to care for children. Um, She is alive today still, but she has lost seven of her children. She's outlived seven of her children. There's only two of us left, and I'm proud to say that I'm one of them. And my 
my desire is always to honor her. She can no longer speak and can no longer tell stories, but I long to hear those stories. And I'm sorry that she lost that ability before she was able to pass that on to me. So with this event, it, it's next Thursday, June 10th, 2000, um, oh, that's not what I, 10.30 to 3.30, as well as Friday, 10.30 to 3.30. We got the privilege of going out to um, Beardy's Reserve to talk with an elder, Loretta Mandes, and she, um, she has agreed to come and do the opening ceremonies, and I believe we're going to do opening ceremonies both Thursday and Friday morning at 10.30, and she will be there throughout the day. We are inviting you to come and paint a rock orange and place it around the perimeter of the Good, Na Good Neighbors Food Center. Orange and black paint will be provided. We ask that <clears throat> no pictures be taken. It's, it's sacred time, and it's not a place for pictures or video. The only thing, the only videos we will allow is once the rocks are placed around the perimeter, we will allow a picture there, but no people are in those pictures, please. We know in our hearts, and we believe, that both locally and nationally, many lives have been affected by residential schools and continue to be affected. We want to provide a time to pause, to listen, to grieve, and to tell story, to be heard, and to remember the 215 children discovered, the first 215 children to be discovered. Everyone is welcome to participate in the way that they need to. And we will be outside the Good Neighbors Food Center, and you'll see us. Um, we'll have orange tablecloths. Rocks are very sacred in Aboriginal culture, and that's why we've chosen to paint a rock. Um, COVID-19 protocols will be in place. Um, it will be outdoors, and so if you choose, you can wear a mask. And a bag lunch will be provided as well as bottled water. And the bag lunch is significant of a feast that the Aboriginal people would, would have at a, a gathering like this. Um, I invite you to come if you can participate by helping us make bag lunches or come and paint a rock in memory. And our goal is to get 215 rocks painted and placed around the perimeter of the Good Neighbors Food Center. I think that's everything. Thank you. Would you stand with us and continue worshiping God together?
my captain, my soul's trusted Lord. All my allegiance is rightfully yours. Like the wind, you'll guide, clear the skies before me, and I'll fly. my captain, my soul's trusted Lord. All my allegiance is rightfully yours. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Sheba and team, for leading us in that time of praise. As we move into a moment of reflection, I want to thank you um, for those who give financially to support our ministries and that of our partners as we work to further God's kingdom among us. As you may know, we have a few opportunities or different ways you can give. You can give online via e-transfer. You can use the donation box on your way out. Or you can stop by the office and drop off a check or cash to Kim. She loves to visit with you, so feel free to stop by um, this week. 
I also wanted to say that Starla had mentioned if you would like to participate in the event happening at Good Neighbors but can't get there, you're welcome to drop off a painted rock um, during the week on Tuesday or Wednesday when we are in the office and Starla will pick them up and make sure that they are taken and placed there. Please join me in a word of prayer before we take a moment to pause. Holy God, thank you for your great love for us and that we never have to doubt it. Lord, we see your goodness in the new life bursting forth in the earth around us, your power in the storms we've had, and your provision through the rains that we needed. Thank you for hearing our prayers. God, you know our needs and we want to lift them up to you, both the ones that are spoken and those that aren't. Father, we think of the staff at Redbury and ask that you continue to lead and guide them as they shift again and prepare for a season of overnight camps. Lord, provide the staff, the finances, and the volunteers that they need. God, our desire is that kids and young adults would come to know you through this ministry. So we ask that you would be moving and softening the hearts of campers and staff already so that they can hear your word and receive it. Lord, we think of our national conference and the leaders there. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be refreshing them as they lead our conference. Give them your eyes and heart for our churches and for our nation. Father, we continue to pray for our missions partners serving around the world. Lord, renew their passion for your gospel. Sustain their families. And we ask that you provide them with times of fellowship and places of community that would help them to grow in their own spiritual walk. And God, we ask that you would show us how to be a light in our community, in our families, and in our homes. We long for your presence, Lord, and we ask that you would draw near to us and speak to us this morning. Amen. We're just going to pause for a moment of reflection, and then Rod will come and bring us a message for today. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed this morning. It's been a more serious service, but that's appropriate, right? It's good. And thank you again to Starla and to Melissa and Kelsey and Sheba for leading us. So it's good, good to be here. But I brought a soccer ball up here. So uh, it is, of course, the Euros this month, if you're a soccer fan. And I am also coaching... Um, this year with Leanne, our U13 Hepburn team, and we are now playing games, craziness. So a game tonight, and I think there's kids playing at all levels, so very fun. So soccer, I've been, I've been trying to teach these grade 6 and 7. If you want a pastor who really knows how to play soccer, it should be the other guy, the one who's canoeing up north, Greg. Uh, not me, because I'm not a, really a player. I did play as a kid, but I love soccer. I'm really passionate about it. And so when I try to teach these young ones about soccer, I have a motto this year with them. I'm like, soccer is a game of keep away. It's actually a game of keep away. If we have the ball, we win. They don't have the ball, they can't score against us, right? So we've got to keep the ball. We've got to know how to dribble, how to control it ourselves. We have to know how to move it around the pitch, right? Right, Josh? Right. Keep away, right? I'm not coaching Josh. Josh is... Josh is better than I can coach. Um, But anyway, just wanted his affirmation on that. See, but it starts, before we can play keep away, we have to know how to receive the ball. Like, if the ball is coming towards me and I don't know how to receive it, well, then I can't make a pass and I can't do my awesome Ronaldo stepovers and all that stuff. Um, It starts with receiving. There's nothing more important than being able to receive the ball. Then I can make my my messy-like pass into the box and find my teammate and we can win the game. See, I can't give anything to my team unless I receive first. And that's kind of a general principle that I want to reflect on this morning. We can't give unless we receive first. Can't give unless we receive first. A few weeks back in our little series we're hanging out in, Jesus' Greatest Hits, We uh, looked at a time when Jesus wasn't showing his greatness by doing something amazing, but by allowing himself to be done to. And that that even came up last week when we talked about the cross. Jesus allowed himself in this situation of his anointing, he allowed himself to be anointed by a woman. 
Mary perhaps, who brought expensive oils and washed his feet and dried them with her hair in this extravagant expression of love. And Jesus showed his greatness by receiving from someone. This week, we're going to look at another story. It's kind of a B-side to that anointing story. Sorry, I just got to find it here. Uh, John chapter 13. And what I did this week is I printed it for you. It's going to be on the screen too, but in, with your bulletin, there's a printed copy. And I thought that might be helpful for you to follow along. If you don't have a, a Bible or a device, you can, you can look on there. Um, this story is interesting because in this one, it's only recorded by John, and Jesus is doing the washing of the feet. So it's kind of the the reverse, the inverse, so I'm calling it a B-side of one of Jesus' greatest hits. Um, So we're going to take some time, look at this story from John 13, and it begins with this really interesting uh, statement. He sets the stage, he says, now before the festival of the Passover, so we're in the last few days of Jesus' life, Um, and this is the, the festival that's happening in Jerusalem, this big gathering called the Passover. And we, as we saw last week, if you were with us in John's story, the whole point is Jesus is going to become the Passover lamb. And he's going to offer himself in a way that takes away the sins of the world. So it's in this time, these last few days Jesus has on earth. And here is what happens. So let's read on in this. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he'd come from God and was going to God, I'm going to stop there for a minute, the end of that little section I bolded on the handout. John's given us, like, inside info, right? Like, he's, he's an author, and he's telling us what's going on inside, particularly Jesus and in this guy named Judas. Now, I can't explain the Judas part fully, this statement that John makes about the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Um, I don't know what exactly that means. I do know from reading Scripture, the whole thing here, that sin and evil, they work like forces that oppose us, and they take personal form in this character that scripture calls the devil, or the Satan, the accuser. So they they work against us. But I also know, secondly, we're never victims. There's no devil made me do it. We're never helpless victims in the wickedness that we are a part of, and do each to each other all the time. Uh, we always have a choice to make. So will I act on this idea, this thought, this thing, this circumstance? What am I going to do? Or am I going to choose to take that little bit of light and head towards goodness and truth? Now Judas apparently has made or is in the process of making a poor choice, choosing to act poorly. But John's focus here isn't on that. It's going to come back. He's going to come back to the Judas piece. But John's focus is on what Jesus understands about himself. What does Jesus know about himself? Well, Jesus first knew the time. He knew the hour had come. He knew that his time was ending, which, humanly speaking, even wasn't probably hard for him to guess. He knew the forces, the powerful people in Jerusalem were gathering against him uh, to get rid of him. Jesus also, though, knew his source and his his destiny, where he was going going, where, who, where he'd come from and where he was going. That's what it says here, right? Um, he's going to go to the Father. He'd come from God and was going to God. And that really, if you put that all together, Jesus knew who he was. He, he had this word in the, in the family service we just finished. We were talking about the word confidence. Well, Jesus had this confidence because he knew who he was and where he was going. He, he's like, I, I, know, I know this. But then next, we also know that the Father had given all things into his hand. All things into his hand. But, it, but it's not just a generic all, because just before that, we're told, this includes, specifically says, his own, his own ones who were in the world. Those are the ones that he's going to love and show particular love to. So Jesus had these, these own ones 
in the world. Like Jesus had received from the Father all things. He was about to inherit the universe in a way. But Jesus was given to some people, particular people with names and with like scars on their bodies and particular skin color and annoying habits, right? These, these were Jesus' peeps, right? They were real people. Um, and Jesus had these ones. He had received those from his father as well. And then Jesus, knowing who he was, knowing his identity, knowing where he was going, then he's able to give, as John talks about, to having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Or maybe better, completely. He loved them completely, like fully, like all in, did all the way. So you see the, you see the pattern here that we were talking about? Jesus first received the ball, as we might say, from his father. An identity, a mission, a few people to love. And then he gave to them. So even Jesus, this pattern's true. Receive, then we give. So let's read on. Let's see what happens here. So Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you don't know now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who's bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now, stop there again for a second. It's, it's a story from another culture, right? In those sandaled times, we might say, a guest would arrive for dinner and, and you know, they provide a basin of water uh, to wash their feet in, to get all the donkey doo-doo off their feet, right? Uh, before you're going to lie down, because right? remember, they lied down on couches in that time. And so you put your feet up on the nice couch. You don't want your dirty sandaled feet up there. And so um, this would be normal. If the household was large and had household servants in there, then sometimes the servants would be asked to wash guests' feet. But now here's Jesus, the leader and rabbi of this traveling gang, and he's taking off his dinner clothes, wrapping himself in a towel, and making himself a servant, caring for his friends' bodies. And of course, they're shocked. They're like, Jesus and they're they're silent in their confusion except for Peter Peter always opens his mouth and he's like uh Lord nope never ever ever are you gonna wash my feet and he's it's really emphatic in the text he's like no never ever in all till wherever whatever freezes over you are not washing my feet and Jesus's response sounds a little odd it sounds a little rough Jesus says unless I wash you you have no share in with me Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Which, we don't get it in the English here, but it's kind of funny. There's this comic misunderstanding because the word Jesus uses, he talks about, you have no part with me, which is the normal word for body parts. So then Peter's like, oh, body parts? Okay, I'll, what about my hands and my head too? And he starts listing off these things. And Jesus is like, uh, Peter, you're not getting it. And so Jesus is laughing, you know, it's like, Pete, 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 Pete. You, you've already bathed, you're already clean, which Jesus explains in another chapter here and says, you're clean because of the word I've spoken to you. That's what he says to his disciples. You've, you've received who I am, you've believed me, you've listened. Don't worry, it's good. But right now, Peter, he says, this is about washing your feet, which is the point. Unless you are humble enough to let me love you by washing your feet... Unless you're actually willing to receive something from me, well, if you can't receive from me, how are we going to be in a relationship? How are we going to be in a relationship, Peter? If you're too proud, you're too into yourself, you have to always be the one in charge, giving away. Well, what are we doing here then, Peter? If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not going to let me serve you, well, then what kind of relationship are we going to have? Can we share anything? Peter, can we share? Because there is the risk that, like 
someone else in this room, Jesus says, who is not truly willing to share. Now, maybe Judas actually in this situation went through the show of letting Jesus wash his feet, but we're getting the inside scoop here. And Judas is not really opening himself to Jesus. He's not allowing Jesus into his life. I, I don't know. It's an interesting point. Like, what, if I were there in that room, would I allow Jesus, this really important person who I'm really into, to wash my feet? I don't know. But Judas wasn't, at least in his heart. He wasn't willing. We read on. After he had washed their feet, Jesus, he put on his robe and had to return to the table. Then he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? To you. you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. So if I, your teacher, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but it's to fulfill the scripture, the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Pause there again. Now, if you're like me, you're going you're gonna to hear the, the ought, right? You're going to notice the ought to wash one another's feet, because I know most of you, and you're mostly good people, and you're going to be like, oh, I want to be a good person, so... Jesus is saying, I ought to do this. Um, now, some Christian traditions, including actually the Mennonite Brethren tradition, took, took Jesus' words here and said, oh, we've got to have a ceremony here. We've got to like, actually wash each other's feet, um, even once sandals were out of touch. And so this tradition of foot washing ceremonies existed even in the Anabaptist tradition. Um, and some of you probably have experienced that, like literally washing another person's feet, maybe in some mission strip or some church activity, probably on the stage, I'm assuming, because foot washings have happened. And those are good things. Ceremonial foot washing, great, great thing to, to do. But I think Jesus is thinking far more than just about foot washing. Like, that was just a practical thing in his day. Um, he's talking about serving other people in love, right? And particularly, he's pointing out leaders, if you're going to lead, you've got to serve. Um, and that fits with lots of stuff Jesus says in the New Testament, we're not, you know, Paul says, don't look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. But let's be honest, like, that can feel overwhelming. Like, if you're a good-intentioned person, you're like, oh, I ought to serve everybody. Oh, my goodness. So many needs in the world. What can I do? But let's think back to soccer. Just go back to the basics again here. So what's the, what did I say? We can't give unless we first receive. Jesus says in this little text, he says, guys, I've set you an example. I have set you an example, you, my friends, or more broadly, laid out for you a pattern. But I think, here's what I think. I think the pattern Jesus is setting for them, and John wants us to notice, it's not just about the giving. It's also about the receiving. The pattern includes the receiving part. Because, like Jesus points out, he says, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. Jesus knows that he has been sent from the Father. And he knows who he is. He knows his mission. His mission is to bring people to the Father. He knows the particular people the Father has given him to love, his own ones. Ah, okay, I've received from the Father. Now I'll go and wash their feet. He first receives from his Father, then he gives his whole self, fully and completely. That's the pattern, I think, that Jesus then says, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. Now, Judas, again, tragically reveals the opposite pattern. He was trying to get from Jesus in some way. He's like, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus because Jesus is an important person. He's going to bring in a kingdom and, oh dear, I'm so frustrated. I'm mad at him. I'm going to betray him. Whatever. He was trying to get, 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 get. He was trying to get his own way. 
And Jesus warns him even here. He says, he quotes a psalm, and he says, the one who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. It's feet, right? So instead of letting Jesus pass the ball to him, he's like doing high boot with Jesus. He's like, right? He's fighting with Jesus with his heel. He's lifting it. He's trying to steal the ball from the one who wants to pass to him. Okay, okay, you're saying, let's pause for a second. You're saying, okay, Rod, I hear you. The pattern is about receiving first, then giving. But Rod, like, I'm not in that room. Jesus is not offering literally to wash my feet. How do I receive from Jesus? Like, practically, what does that look like? Well, first I'd say there's many ways we can receive from Jesus, depending on our personalities and our experiences. Jesus can meet us alone on a quiet walk in the woods and encourage our hearts. Or when we're reading scripture, Jesus can meet us and we realize the truth and the significance of his death and his resurrection. We, Jesus can meet us through books and sunsets and bumper stickers, right? We can receive from Jesus in all kinds of ways. But there's one really important and tangible way that's right here in this story. See, Jesus had his own people, his peeps that God had given him to love. Now Jesus tells us to wash one another's feet. I think Jesus is giving us to one another. He's saying, okay, I'm going to be out of here. I'm leaving. But I'm giving you to you and you to you and you to you. I'm giving you to one another, to love one another by serving one another. But that's not going to happen unless somebody receives, <laughs> right? If we're all going after the ball, if nobody's going to receive a pass, right? If we're all just going to be like, you know, eight-year-olds playing soccer, right? <laughs> You're all in a big clump, following the ball around. You're all fighting. You're like, the parents are going, you're on the same team, (laughs) right? And they're kicking at each other and trying to get the ball. If We're not going to be a very good team if no one is willing to receive from one another. Because listen, I think receiving is the whole point here because listen to the way Jesus ends. He says, truly, 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 truly. Let me tell you the plain old truth. Whoever receives one whom I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. One whom I send. Well, who's Jesus sending? He's sending you and me. And who's he sending us to? One another. So if I receive you, then I'm receiving Jesus. And if I receive Jesus, I'm receiving the Father. Package deal. Right? Do you see it? Isn't that cool? What matters isn't how amazing I am at washing people's feet. Ooh, look at me. I'm such a great foot washer, such a servant. What matters is if I'm willing to receive from the one that Jesus sends me. So who is Jesus sending here? That's the question, isn't it? Because Jesus says, the one sent isn't greater than the sender, right? If I receive you, or you, or you, or you, the one Jesus sent to me, I receive Jesus himself, and Jesus is the greater one. And Jesus says, I've come, and I'm not even the greatest one, I want to bring glory to the Father, and so on. I want to receive you, if that means I get to receive Jesus. How often do I act a bit like Peter and refuse someone else's service and say, oh, no, 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 you can't wash my feet. I need to wash your feet. I am am the one. I need to serve you. When I do that, do I miss Jesus? Jesus can meet us in many ways, but one of the essential, unavoidable ways we receive from Jesus is through the people he sends into our lives. Right? And he sends you and you and you into my life, and he sends me into your life. And that's how Jesus wants to arrive. We are each other's own ones to love. 
but it starts with the receiving from those own ones. Now, I, as many of you know, I, not too long ago, I came back from a sabbatical leave, and it, I, I reflected quite a bit on my own role as pastor here. And there's great risk in being a leader of any sort, even being a servant leader. I'm a servant leader. Um, Because it's easy to focus on what I'm giving instead of what I'm receiving, right? Look how many feet I wash. I'm so tired. (laughs) The pattern Jesus lays out for us, even this very chapter, it starts with Jesus knowing what he's received. It starts with receiving. And then, once I've received, I give. And specifically in here now, because Jesus has returned to his Father, he's given us to each other, and so we receive from one another. Which means, I think, in the church, mutuality. We've got, we've got to have mutuality. My ministry as a pastor will be measured by my first receiving from you. Because if I receive you, I'm receiving Jesus. Too many leaders, I think, lift their heel and refuse to receive from the ones they're leading. No, 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 you can't wash my feet, that's my job. Jesus himself received first. He received from his father, but remember the story this all started with? He received from Mary. He let a woman wash his feet. And he said, this is good. He let her wash his feet in public. Mutuality takes humility because all relationships require humility. A whole lot of it. Unless you allow me to wash your feet, Peter, what share can we have? How can we share anything? As we've talked about earlier in our service, this week's news from BC has me reflecting lots on what it means to be a church leader. It's like, oh, I'm a leader in the church in Canada. Now, I am not, I dare not, think about pointing fingers of blame because I know my own heart. But I find myself wondering, what if those who had been serving in those residential schools had believed in the kind of mutuality that Jesus is talking about here? What if they had grasped Jesus' words and believed that the children that had come to the school, brought there forcibly, horribly, But what if they believed those children had something to offer them? And if they'd first received? With that sort of humility, the kind that Jesus models for us. Maybe things would have been different. Maybe history and much of history would have changed. But it's always up for us to respond ourselves. So... What does mutuality look like for me? Well, it starts first, I think, with noticing our own ones. With whom am I invited into mutuality? Who have I been given to? Jesus knows we're finite people. He doesn't give us the whole world to love and to be loved by. He can't. He can't. He can't fix even Canada or Saskatchewan or central Saskatchewan. Right? We have our circles. So who's in there? Who are the people? Who are my neighbors physically? Who are my work colleagues? Who are my, uh, the people at the co-op that I run into? Who are, who are, who are? Who are those people? Who are my own ones? Because those are given to you. Will you receive from them? Second, how can I receive first? I read, during my sabbatical, I read a book called Sabbatical Journey by Henry Nowen, and he says this, We who offer spiritual leadership often find ourselves not living what we're preaching or teaching. I often call people to a life that I'm not fully able to live myself. I am learning that the best cure for hypocrisy is community. When as a spiritual leader, I live close to those I care for, when I can be criticized in a loving way by my own people and be forgiven for my own shortcomings, then I won't be considered a hypocrite. I like that. That's an answer I would give to that question. 
I want to learn how to receive from you truth, forgiveness, correction, accountability. Just give it to me. Tell me, please. That's one thing I think for myself. I want to just pause for two minutes. We'll, again, play a song. And I'm just going to invite you to turn to people you came with or find someone nearby or reflect quietly by yourself. But chat about those two questions. Who are your own ones? Like, who are they? Who are your people that God's given you? And what does mutuality mean in terms of receiving first? What does that look like for you? So let's take just a minute or two, and then I'll come up and pray. showing us what love is. We wouldn't have a clue uh, without you. Um, thank you for even showing us what you received and the ways you received, how you let Mary wash your feet, how you knew who you were from your father. You spent time with him. You just modeled everything for us, uh, the whole pattern. Um, and ultimately, by giving your life for us, you showed us the way of love and of life. So, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, by your Spirit, may we learn this pattern that you set. And may we learn to receive from you through one another. To live in mutuality. To grow humility amongst us. To learn to listen and to receive from one another. Teach us about this. Uh, lead us in your way of life. We pray this in the name of the Father, whose love is over all things. In the name of Jesus, and in the name of the Spirit. Amen. So, Jesus has sent you to one another to receive first from one another because if you receive one another, you receive Jesus. And if you receive Jesus, you receive the Father. So, go in that spirit, in the spirit of God, who is the spirit of mutuality and love.